Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Lauren Artilles, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science and the Harvard Library, I'm honored to introduce this virtual event with Katie Mack and Kim Stanley Robinson, presenting their books, The End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking, and The Ministry for the Future, a novel. I hope you're all well and safe on this very snowy day in Boston. Thank you for joining us virtually. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. Coming up in the series on Tuesday, January 5th at 7 p.m., we'll host renowned paleoanthropologist and Harvard professor Daniel Lieberman for the publication day launch of his book, Exercise, why something we never evolved to do is healthy and rewarding. To learn more about this and our other upcoming virtual events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com backslash science for more info. We also have a Science Research Public Lectures YouTube channel where you can view previous talks you might have missed. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. So if you have a question for our authors at any time during the talk tonight, click at the Q&A Q button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting links to purchase The End of Everything and the Ministry for the Future on harvard.com, as well as the link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thank you to all of you for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie bookselling, and especially for science because it really, really matters in this difficult time and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over this past year, technical issues may arise. So if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm honored to introduce tonight's speakers. Dr. Catherine Mack is a theoretical astrophysicist who studies a range of questions in cosmology, the study of the universe from beginning to end. She currently holds the position of Assistant Professor of Physics at North Carolina State University, where she is also a member of the Leadership in Public Science Cluster. Throughout her career, she has studied dark matter, the early universe, galaxy formation, black holes, cosmic strings, and the ultimate fate of the cosmos. Alongside her academic research, she is an active science communicator and has been published in a number of popular publications, such as Scientific American, The New York Times, Slate, Sky and Telescope, and Cosmos Magazine, where she is a columnist. Kim Stanley Robinson is a New York Times bestselling author and winner of the Hugo, Nebula, and Locus Awards. He's the author of more than 20 books, including the bestselling Mars Trilogy and the critically acclaimed New York 2140, The Years of Rice and Salt, and 2312. In 2008, he was named a Hero of the Environment by Time Magazine, and he works with the Sierra Nevada Research Institute. Tonight, these venerable thinkers and writers will be discussing their newest books, which grapple with the limits of our earth, our civilizations, and our universe through imaginative and scientific inquiry. In The End of Everything, Katie Mack looks at five different possibilities for the end of the universe, from heat death to vacuum decay, introducing readers to cutting edge concepts in quantum mechanics, cosmology, string theory, and more along the way. Carlo Rovelli praises The End of Everything as full of wit and lightness, saying, I have learned from Mac plenty of things I did not know, and I have found myself staring out of the window, meditating about the end of it all. In Stan's new novel, a horrifyingly plausible heat wave sparks mass death and the collision between forces fighting climate change, the global bureaucratic effort and those taking more extreme measures. Vox's Ezra Klein says the ministry for the future is the most important book I've read this year. I wish every policymaker and everyone would read the book not because I agree with everything in it, but because it clarifies the present so sharply. So we are absolutely thrilled to be hosting them here tonight. Um, without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Katie and Stan. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lauren. Um, um, well, we have a plan here. Um, I'm gonna read for a couple of minutes from the Ministry for the Future. And then Katie's going to read uh, for a few minutes from her book, and then we'll uh, discuss for a while. And then Lauren will come back in to let us know when it's time to do the Q&A. And I, I, I want to preface my um, reading by saying it's great to be doing something with the Harvard Bookstore. Uh, I was a graduate student in Boston for a year. 
I lived in Alston and it was a big deal for me to cross the Charles on a bridge and go over to Harvard Square and go into the Harvard bookstore and be in a kind of utopia of books. So I remember it fondly and having been, you know, in Antarctica and um, in the high Sierra for many months of my life, I can say that I have never been colder than when crossing the uh, Charles River. Um, so it's a fond memory. And so I'm just going to read, I think of this actually as my, um, this is the only maybe Katie Mack um, passage in the Ministry <laughs> for the Future, but I've got so much uh, crap in this book that I can actually find something that is relevant. Um, this is um, the, the eyewitness account of a young woman who's remembering her childhood as a refugee in Switzerland and her mother gets involved with um, one of the Western aid workers. Um, then mother told us that she was going to marry Jake and we would all move in with him in a nearby village. My sister and I had had no inkling this might happen and at first we were surprised and uncertain. The shelter was again the nicest place we had ever known and going off with a single one of our helpers into the unknown struck us as a bad idea. We didn't know what was going on between mother and this man with the twitchy eyes and we suspected the worst. But in fact, we moved nearby into a little two-story white house with a walled garden beside it and settled in quickly and went back off into the shelters to see our friends there. Jake and mother were always warm and cordial to each other, although they were never openly affectionate in front of us. But we could see that mother was fond of him and grateful to him. And he was always very kind to us and always spoke to us in a mix of French and English so that it seemed like the two languages were one. And later it took some sorting out on our part to get the two into their separate places in our heads. In that effort, Arabic seemed to slip away. So we were a little family for a few years from when I was seven till I was 11. We went to school in Vintertour, played with friends from school and from the shelter and all was well. In those years, my mother was happy. Then I began to see signs that things were not going well between my mother and Jake. They would sit in our kitchen after dinner looking at their screens or out the window. Watching them together, I saw something that struck me very strongly, even just sitting there doing nothing. They were very different people. My mother is a calm person. She pours herself into a chair and relaxes there like a cat. Her eyes will move, her hands will do some sewing or knitting, but her body is as still as can be. This is somewhat her nature. We're lucky to have her. Jake, on the other hand, would sit there and yet he wasn't even close to still. Not that he fidgeted or tapped his foot or anything like that. It was just that you could see that he was spinning inside. It was like you could see all his atoms spinning the way they are said to do. If people could be rated for their spins, like atoms or car engines, then mother would be almost motionless while Jake was always spinning at thousands or even millions of revolutions per minute. RPM 10 million, he said once, this whole image I'm giving you comes from one of his own ways of assessing people. He would say, we are all like quarks, which are the smallest elementary particles, he told us, smaller even than atoms, such that atoms are all made up of quarks held together by gluons. He made us laugh with these stories. And like quarks, everyone had a certain amount of strangeness, spin, and charm. You could rate everyone by these three constants. And our mother was one of the most charming people on earth, but not very strange, and with almost zero spin. Jake confessed to having a high spin rate, also strangeness. And we found him charming too. He didn't agree with that. Let's stop there. Thanks, I, uh, I really enjoyed reading that passage. Um, that was, uh, that was uh, a, a, a nice little sort of Easter egg. There are, there are a lot of that, those passages in the book actually, little, little pieces of, uh, of science where um, where you get to you get to kind of guess what the uh, uh, you know what the what the topic is going to be and and you you sort of figure it out as you go. I I enjoyed I enjoyed those pieces a lot. It well, I want to hear your reading, but it does occur to me yeah. that dang, I could I have a passage written from the point of view of a photon that would have been even more Katie Mack like. But um, <laughs> we'll save that for later. Let's go sure, over sure. to yours. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So. Um, I will I will read a, a little bit from um, from the the chapter about the big rip. So so in, in in my book I have the you know I go through these five different ways that the universe could end and um, and one of them is is called the big rip, um, and it has to do with 
a sort of worst case scenario for dark energy. Uh, dark energy being whatever the mysterious stuff is that's making the universe expand faster and faster. Um, so I have a bit in this chapter where I talk about what what that will do to the universe um, at the at the sort of very end. Um, so I'll, I'll start reading there. You can think of it as an unraveling. The first things to go are the largest, most tenuously bound, giant clusters of galaxies in which groups of hundreds or thousands of galaxies flow lazily around each other in long intertwined paths, begin to find that those paths are growing longer. The wide spaces traversed by the galaxies over millions or billions of years widen even more, causing the galaxies at the fringes to slowly drift away into the growing cosmic voids. Soon, even the densest galaxy clusters find themselves inexorably dissipated, their component galaxies no longer feeling any central pull. From a vantage point within our galaxy, the loss of the clusters should be the first ominous sign that the big rip is in progress. But the speed of light delay, the speed of light delays this clue until we are already feeling the effects much closer to home. As our local cluster, Virgo, begins to dissipate, its previously languid motion away from the Milky Way begins to pick up speed. This effect is subtle, though. The next one is not. We already have astronomical all-sky surveys that are capable of measuring the positions and motions of billions of stars within our own galaxy. As the big rip approaches, we start to notice that the stars on, on the edges of the galaxy are not coming around in their expected orbits, but instead drifting away like guests at a party at the end of the evening. Soon, af soon after, our night sky begins to darken as the great Milky Way swath across the sky fades. The galaxy is evaporating. From this point, the destruction picks up its pace. We begin to find that the orbits of the planets are not what they should be, but are instead slowly spiraling outward. Just months before the end, after we've lost the outer planets to the great and growing blackness, the earth drifts away from the sun and the moon from the earth. We too enter the darkness alone. The calm of this new solitude doesn't last. At this point, any structure still intact is straining under the push of the expanding space within it. The earth's atmosphere thins from the top. Tectonic motions within the earth respond chaotically to the shifting gravitational forces. With only hours to go, the Earth cannot hold together. Our planet explodes. Even the destruction of the Earth could, in principle, be survivable if, having interpreted the signs, you have already retreated to some compact space-based capsule. There's a footnote here. When the danger is space itself, you want to be in a structure that has as little space in it as possible. But that reprieve is short-lived. Before long, the electromagnetic forces that hold together your atoms and molecules cannot hold up against the ever-expanding space within all matter. In the last tiny fraction of a second, molecules crack open, and any thinking beings still holding on are destroyed, torn atom from atom with, from within. Beyond that point, there is no possibility of watching the destruction, but it carries on nonetheless. Nuclei themselves, the ultra-dense matter in the centers of atoms, are the next to go. The impossible, um, impossibly dense cores of black holes are eviscerated. And at the final instant, the fabric of space itself is ripped apart. Yikes. <laughs> okay, well, that puts our problems in perspective here. <laughs> the end of uh, uh, 2020, and besides which, we're about to hit 2021, which is almost certainly going to be a much better year in several different ways. So um, happy us. Um, I got a question for you, Katie. Sure. I've been reading books like yours um, since I was a young teenager with huge interests. And, and I think yours is exceptionally good in terms of its clarity and ability Thank for you. a lay person and an English major to understand. And I remember when I was young, my dad would buy these books. They were by George Gamow, mm. one of the great Hungarian physicists who uh, wrote a series of popular books about physics. Um, one, two, three, infinity is one that I remember that was on my shelves for years and I might still have my dad's copy. And then I've read, uh, you know, I keep reading them. Um, uh, I found Stephen Hawking very difficult to understand. I found um, Stephen Weinberg kind of um, disdainful of the humanities, you might say. Um, mm -hmm. I, I found Penrose uh, uh, fascinating, even despite the fact that the mathematical sections were incomprehensible to me. 
uh, but very thought provoking and, and kind of liberating uh, us from the idea that the brain is a computer. So I guess what I, I'm saying is I wonder, um, did you read book like these and is that what kind of inspired you to do your own or did you just think there's a need for something like this? Um, a kind of mix of both. So I, I read A Brief History of Time when I was, uh, when I was sort of a young teenager, um, maybe, maybe slightly younger. And, and I didn't, I didn't understand all of it at the time, but I was, I was fascinated with the ideas. I read, um, I read Paul Davies' About Time, uh, which is a, 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 a great, um, I mean, he's, he's great, um, he is uh, great explainer. Um, and, and I was fascinated by the ideas of you know the malleability of time in physics and and space and you know the big bang and black holes and all of those kinds of topics um but uh but since you know since then i i read very little nonfiction actually and i read even less popular science um partially because uh, it's when i do i'm constantly back translating you know, because I'll read I'll read a popular depiction of you know the Big Bang or or black holes or something, and and it'll use some analogies, some simplifications, whatever. And so I'm when I'm reading that, my mind is going, oh, they're, what they're trying to refer to there is this, and 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 so there's it's just this a huge amount of extra work really when I when I read these things, trying to figure out what were they really trying to say, what's the technical version, and then you know, and then there's an aspect of of kind of uh, you know evaluating like would I put it this way would I say it differently um, is the audience holding on and and so I find reading popular physics books slightly stressful um, I read almost entirely science fiction uh, and uh, and that is that is what you know um, inspires me and and kind of opens my mind to uh, to new ideas and and I guess that. One of the one of the things I was able to do with this book, as, as such as in the in the passage I just read, was to imagine uh, this this uh, you know what it would be like to live in in this process as it's happening, um, and and to put myself in the position of that sort of future consciousness watching the universe be torn apart <laughs> or or yeah. fading away or or whatever you know in these various uh, in these various uh, kind of scenarios. Uh, so I think when I when I decided to write this book, part of it was that I wanted to I wanted to get these ideas out there because there aren't that many books about the end of the universe. There are a lot about the beginning, um, not a whole lot about our cosmic future, um, and I wanted to have a chance to kind of write about all all my favorite um, all my favorite pieces of cosmology and uh, all the fun little facts about, about the universe. Like the fact that when you look at really, really distant things, they stop getting smaller as they get farther away and start getting bigger because of the expansion of space. And that's really weird, <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, yeah. So there's, you know, so stuff like that was, was really fun. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think my writing style is, is hugely inf inf influenced by the fact that, that I, I read, I read almost nothing but science fiction. And, and of course, you know, when I, um, you know, I read I read the Mars trilogy uh, when I was younger, and I I, I found that uh, deeply inspiring. Uh, just just think, is thinking about the you know, I loved that it was it was written with all of the practicalities in mind, and and all of the the real you know what it what is what are actually going to be the scientific challenges, and what are they going to be the the social challenges and the economic challenges, and and what will it be like over this extremely long process to, um, to change a world. And, uh, you know, I, I, love, uh, I love those kinds of uh, stories where, where you're, you're in a, a, a different world, you're in a different situation, but you're also, there's, it, it has that realism and that, um, uh, the, this, all the details so you can really dig into the science of it. Um, so, so, you know, your, your work has, has been uh, hugely inspiring to me. So I appreciate it. Well, thank you for that. Um, it, it, um, I, I must say that when I wrote Red Mars, um, I felt like I was throwing myself off of a cliff into the land of science writing where I, uh, since we had so much new information about Mars, it was a worthy, um, uh, project to try to put it all into a novel, despite the um, the sounds of gears grinding and the and the, what everybody remarks on the incredible slowness of the pace. 
in the Mars trilogy, but I think uh, speed in novels is a variable thing and it was worth doing in that case. So I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I think with your book, what's interesting for me, I uh, just read it in these last few days, is the way that I'm um, talking about the end of the universe, the, the potential ways in which this universe might come to an end is actually a great organizing principle for talking about everything else in physics. You have to talk about mm -hmm. the beginning. You have to talk about uh, gravity and the uh, other forces and how we, we don't seem to have a good correlation between gravity and quantum mechanics and what that might mean. And in short, in order to talk about the end in any um, coherent or meaningful way, you have to set us up by uh, describing everything else going on currently in physics too. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who are reading, we hear, you know, dark matter. And I think it was you who told me, well, really it should be invisible matter. Um, mm -hmm. And then dark energy, that's even worse. I'm, I'm, it's, um, we need you to, um, <laughs> to bring some clarity to these names because I think all physicists are actually struggling with how do you put it into language? You've got these mm -hmm. equations, they're, mm -hmm. They're, they're complicated, they're elegant, they're difficult, but then the results of them, if you're not going to just write another equation to describe what's going on and you try to put it into language, immediately you're having to work with metaphors and mm -hmm. with various kinds of images that bring it home to a reader that's uh, only got the language. And I think that's yeah. a tough task. Yeah, and, and it's it's a um, it's a tough thing to do, not just finding a good metaphor or or whatever, but but deciding what what do we what do I really want to communicate and what what do people need to know about this or or what's useful for people to know about this and and why am I telling them, you know, like I, I could, you know, I could explain this aspect of the problem or I could explain this other aspect or I could just give a much broader picture and what's what's useful about that, what's interesting about that. Um, how do I put it in any kind of context that where it'll matter to anybody? Um, and that's, uh, I think that's a big challenge uh, as, as somebody who's, who's writing about, especially some, something as obscure as theoretical physics, you know, I mean, um, you know, there's, I don't, there's no, uh, you know, news you can use aspect of this if you're, um, if you're just, uh, you know, going about your life. And so there's a, you know, th there are a lot of sort of choices to be made about um, about what, like, yeah, um, what to say, how to say it, and and when when you're being, you know, when you're running the risk of uh, giving people the wrong idea um, in a way that could be a problem, right? So, uh, I mean, I get a lot of messages from people who think that they've found some flaw in in our understanding of physics because because they they read mm -hmm. a metaphor, took it literally carried it to its logical conclusion and then found a contradiction, which, which is a totally reasonable way to approach science. But if you start with the wrong, you know, the wrong conclusion about the metaphor, if you think that it's, it's, it's more accurate than it is, then you end up in a very uh, 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 unreasonable place. And so it's, you have to be really careful about the metaphors you use and, and the language you use in order to not, uh, not lead people into that, into that wrong direction. So yeah, it yeah. can be it can be a real challenge there. It seems to me that it's almost inevitable that um, you have to make a verbal construct for something that not only is in math to begin with, but then um, any attempt to unravel it cognitively. I'm thinking of Heisenberg talking about if you say that you understand quantum mechanics, then that means that you haven't um, thought about it hard enough because it can't be understood. And um, I'm glad you mentioned Paul Davies He's a really excellent science writer, and uh, mm -hmm. I've met him a couple times down at Arizona State. Uh, a, a wonderful guy and an interesting writer whose descriptions of quantum mechanics are the are the ones that have clarified more for me than anything else. Mm -hmm. And I remember him very clearly reading a page by him where he said, "Well, um, fermions and bosons. The way you can tell the difference is that um, they both have spins, and one spin one half, and one spin one. I'm, I'm making this up, but." In one of them, maybe it's bosons, um, it has to spin um, 720 degrees on its axis in order to get back to its original position. And then with fermions, fermions it's, yeah. yes, fermions. Yeah. So, and then bosons, it's just your normal 360 degrees. Well, my brain just, at that point, I just had to say, okay, I don't <laughs> get it. Um, I give up. And, and yet, 
it was a way of uh, communicating the weirdness of quantum mechanics, the way that we mm -hmm. can't um, compare it to something that we see out the window. Yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah, and stuff like that. It's it's also tricky because with those kinds of concepts, it's it's possible to to overdo the weirdness um, such that such that it sounds like you know just all bets are off. It doesn't matter. Like all this is made up and and uh, totally unconnected, and nobody knows anything. And and that's something that happens a lot, especially in in cosmology writing. You know, there's a sort of like we know nothing everything's a mystery you know and then and then people are like okay i'll just make something up and that'll be just as good <laughs> and you know and so being able to like uh being able to communicate that you know this you know this weirdness of spins or whatever is is actually based on a mathematical mm -hmm. uh construct that that makes sense and fits into a bigger picture of a mathematical structure um that's that's also hard to communicate because you know, people aren't used to making mathematical models of, of everyday life, <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah. but that's, that's tough. I mean, so, so one, one thing that I'm, I'm curious about, about your writing is uh, you write a lot of things that are sort of very, very, very close, you know, very, very close to known science, but, but just, you know, have little branches off here and there. And, and even, even in, um, you know, uh, in in other things, I mean, in uh, the years of rice and salt, there's there's a lot of real history and then branches off in, in different ways. Um, how do you how do you choose like where where to make the digressions or or like and 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 do you like do you think about signaling those in some way or or like what what's your what's your uh, I don't know process around choosing where to where the the stuff we know stops and the, and the extrapolation begins? Well, I, um, it, it changes project to project. I base it almost entirely on the idea that comes to me so that um, for my novel about Galileo, I had this image of Galileo falling through his telescope into the 30th century and he's on the moons of Jupiter immediately. And so I said to myself, well, that doesn't, that's crazy, but I want it. So I had to do a time travel novel. And I mean, happily, you didn't have to get into time travel in your book because it's an immediate paradox and a conundrum that you can never mm -hmm. get you can never get out of. But I needed it for that story idea. So then I, I, I worked on hand waving, which you talked about very well, the hand waving aspect um, of a of, uh, um, a quantum entanglement to make a time machine make sense, which it still doesn't. Um, but it, but mainly what I want is to write a good novel. So if I get an idea and say, well, let's talk about the history of the world for 700 years uh, and within a single novel, like in the years of rice and salt, then I'll think to myself, we'll never care about the characters that come in page in on page 600 of a 700 page book. Therefore, I'm going to write a reincarnation novel and they're mm -hmm. going to be the same characters all the way through. And that right. will make it work as an emotional thing. On Mars, the more realistic it was in terms of the details, the more you were going to believe in the characters and their problems. So I just come at it from the novelist's point of view is what's going to make this feel solid as a novel, even mm -hmm. though my original ideas are, are sometimes quite fantastical or at least deeply problematic for fitting them within one novel. And I, that used to give me sleepless nights, but now I'm thinking that um, it's an opportunity. Every mm -hmm. literary problem is just an opportunity and, and it's not like real life problems. So um, yeah, it, I think realism is important. I don't like fantasy. I read science mm -hmm. fiction too. And in fact, you mentioned reading science fiction for I was thinking of end of the world science fiction when I was reading your book. I mean, into the universe, not just mm -hmm. into the world. Mm -hmm. um, and in the 50s, because they only had just come up with the idea of the big crunch, um, you have the um, uh, uh, Poole Anderson's Tau Zero, uh, Zero spaceships yeah. going faster and faster and faster and cannot slow down. And so mm -hmm. they shoot through the big crunch into a new big bang, if I recall mm -hmm. right. That's that's yeah. a tough bit of writing. <laughs> and then um, J James Blish, uh, Cities in Flight. I believe that's a four book series. At the end, again, they have the big crunch and a new big mm. bang that the people have survived the big crunch, which always made me laugh. But 
what you've done in your book is to show that um, there are many, there are is at least several other ways that the universe can come to an end and no longer is the big crunch looking even likely, mm -hmm. um, although it's still on the table. But what I loved that you introduced me to that I had never heard of before is um, a vacuum decay. So in fact, if like if we lose transcription in this, in this Zoom right now, um, <laughs> It might not be our fault. It might be that the universe has just ended in that very second. So, yeah. but as you as you point out, if it happens that way, none of us will know it anyway. So it's not a bad way to go. Yeah. But it's it's remarkable the articulation that you've managed to uh, achieve in this book of of showing how different assumptions about physics and the, and also the data that we have now and the mm -hmm. importance of the cosmological data. It's lovely to see how that can be uh, teased out to these five different fates. It's kind of um, amazing. And even though physics is a little stuck right now, um, you point out that uh, astronomy is not stuck. So that yeah. we might be getting exciting new results even though there are sticky problems that we're stuck on. Yeah, I, that's the, one of the things that I really wanted to talk about in the book was how very small changes to our understanding of of current data just take the universe in vastly different directions so all of these five different ways the universe again which are which are very different in terms of what actually happens in the universe collapsing or expanding forever this bubble of doom like they're all you know uh, consistent with the data at the moment to some degree big crunch sort of less than the others but but um you know none of them are are ruled out and depending on what we find in the next few years with astronomical data uh you know all of these are still possible in, in in one way or another and and that's kind of a fascinating place to be um to be at that at that sort of precipice where where we are getting new data soon and we're learning more and more about the universe and and there are things that are happening in, in physics as well you know in terms of experiments and that's it's, it's sort of in some ways a, a, it's harder to get a, a huge amount of data there but it's um it is a, it's it's a it's a fun place to be as as a theoretical cosmologist although it is i am kind of bummed that i don't get to sort of fast forward 500 years and see what we found out you know that's something yeah, that yeah. um i yeah. i wonder i wonder if you um if you have that feeling about uh you know you've written so many books now about the the sort of the next couple of centuries like do you do you feel like um you know are, are you are you optimistic that it's going to go well you know i know that that you you've been writing more about ways that we can we can improve the the world and you know actually make good choices um wh what do you think about the actual future in terms of not just as a novelist but as somebody looking at the world right now well it's a weird thing and i think it, part of the affect of our time this feeling of disorientation is a literal disorientation like in one of your metaphors um, from where we are right now, we could have a mass extinction event and um, uh, severe climate change and the hammering of civilization and a dark ages that last is for centuries. And from this very same point of right now, we could actually um, get our act together and have a kind of uh, a, a prosperous, sustainable and just society for all the people on the planet and all the animals. Both of those are physically possible. They're, they're technologically possible. So um, that spread of possibilities is so huge that it's confusing and disorienting. And, and there's a feeling of, oh my God, if it's, for one thing, it, it, it's like one of your cone diagrams. It comes mm -hmm. down to the present. What we do in the next 10 years, uh, it creates a radical spread of possible trajectories. So if you do a modeling exercise like you do in the sciences, well, um, a few, uh, it's sensitive dependence on initial conditions, like in chaos theory. A few mm -hmm. things that we do in this next decade can cast us into a good future or a bad. The pressure seems stupendous. And I think it's real. I think every moment in history is unprecedented, but now is more unprecedented than ever before. So, I mean, I'm curious, sure. Um, but what I would wanna say if we, to, I don't even want to stay on this topic very much longer, but what I would say, I guess, is um, it's never going to end. It's never mm -hmm. going to be, uh, apocalypse is the wrong way to talk about it. We are not going to go extinct. 
So we've got the the end of the universe. Okay, we got a hundred billion years. In terms of human history, um, we are not going to come to the point where oh my gosh, we've killed off the last human and we didn't put any people on Mars, which is a stupid idea as a as a eggs uh, not all in one basket. That's terrible. But in any case, we're not going to do that. There's going to be people a century or two from now, and they're going to be coping with whatever the situation is. So it's mm -hmm. best that we try to make it a better situation rather than worse. So this is what I usually say is, look, let's not be pure about it. Let's not be extremist about it. No doom, mm -hmm. no utopia, just go for better rather than worse and leave it yeah. at that. Yeah, yeah, I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I definitely agree with you on that. I, I, I find it, um, you know, I, I think there's there are a lot of debates about the best way to to talk about climate change and and you know induce action and stuff. And but I, I I do find it frustrating a lot of times when I see things like you know oh we only have nine years or twelve years to do something before you know like no it's just it's going to be bad or it's going to be more bad. But like yeah. there's not some deadline at which point we're like oh we lost we give up. <laughs> like, right. That's not yeah. Yeah. that's never going to be what happens. Um, and we we will always be able to make things a little bit better or a little bit worse and you know but but we have you know we have a longer lever arm now like right we have we have more smaller changes now can lead to bigger changes in the future if we keep waiting we're losing that um that that lever arm and 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 you know so that's the thing that that we should keep in mind not just not like we have a deadline and then after that we're all we all give up we're gone so yeah now, before we open to questions, I have one more question for you about physics, because I'm really puzzled by this one. Um, as you say in your book, we've got stupendously good results all across every experiment for um, general relativity. We've got stupendously good results for the standard model. And the two, in ways that only a mathematical people can um, see for real, um, don't correlate with each other. They don't match one of them. I don't know if it's right to say one of them's got to be wrong because both of them seem to be um, completely right in their own frame of reference. Mm. Does, the, I mean, is since they're both so right right now, um, is that a big puzzle for you too, like it is for a lay person? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's a funny thing because we, um, you know, we have we have the standard model of particle physics encapsulates everything about every particle we've ever detected, and it it works. You know, there's no we we found very few places where there's a where there's really wiggle room in that. You know, people can argue about little pieces of it, like you know the mass of neutrinos or something, but it's not. You know, it's basically it works really well, and and um, and so that's great. But we also know that that it can't be the whole story because we don't know where all the parameters in this theory come from. We know that, that quantum mechanics that it's built on doesn't work well with general relativity or theory of gravity. Um, there are certain contradictions you get to in extreme environments where they can't both be correct about what's actually happening in the universe. And, and we, we have this amazing theory of gravity that's passed every test, but it doesn't, work, it doesn't have a quantum version of it so far. So, so we know, you know that doesn't fit with the way we think about the rest of physics. And so we're pretty sure that that we're going to find uh, something wrong with one or both of these these uh, theories, um, but we haven't yet. And until we do, we don't know how to bring them together. We don't know how to build the new theory that's going to encapsulate both and and make everything work. And furthermore, there's this dark matter, dark energy thing that should fit into this somehow, but we don't. That you know they don't really fit into either of these pictures particularly well. Um, so it is, it's, it's a, it's a thing that's kind of frustrating um, in the sense that like we need something to break. So we know, like we need a clue. It's like when you're trying to solve a mystery, you need the criminal to make a mistake <laughs> because otherwise you just don't have anywhere to go. And at the moment, you know, there's, there's no mistake, like nothing, you know, everything is, it's like this perfect crime of, of, you know, keeping us from understanding the universe. Um, and, and so I think that, I think that, I and all other physicists are pretty sure that something is going to be, you know, something is going to show up that's a crack in one of these theories. And, 
and we will find some kind of data that 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 points the way to one of them being wrong or both or you know something something that you know the edge of validity of of these ideas um and so we're just waiting <laughs> we're just trying everything we can think of to to find those edges and um and and uh, you know push on them so you know, at the moment, there are all, there are a couple little clues. We keep pushing on those and, and hoping that those might be hints of, of where to go next and where things are going to actually break. But it's it is a very strange um, situation where it's like, oh, it, it works too well. It must be wrong, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and and we we're we just have, kind of have to keep using all the tools that are at our disposal and and try and find try and find what what's next. Yeah. Well, now see that's where it'd be nice to come back or to get a view to uh, 500 years from now and yeah. assume that something had broken in that time. Yeah. Um, because it does sound like from what all the experts say that there's a, we're at a bit of an impasse for finding that crack in the wall of, of incompatible explanations, which actually from narrative terms is kind of a beautiful um, I wonder if that could be somehow turned into a novel or short story. I'll have to ponder that one. We, we can um, collaborate on something. Yeah, okay. well, I, I must say many of my novels, in fact, the last, uh, I don't know, 10 or so have been based on the idea of an odd couple because I feel now that all couples are odd couples. Um, and, um, and this maybe is another odd coupling. It would be like a Stanislaw Lem story, speaking of science fiction writers who are mm -hmm. also uh, uh, he was one of the, he was maybe the great technologically astute uh, philosophical mm -hmm. science fiction writers, the Polish writer Stanislaw Lem. Uh, MIT is bringing out a new book of short stories of his. He died several years ago, but he wrote so much in Polish and now it's a new set of books in English mm -hmm. that will be really exciting for all of us that love his work. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, we I'm should maybe, oh yeah, here's Lauren. Yeah, okay, here great. I am. So that actually Hi. starts us off on a great foot because we've gotten several questions asking for both of you to recommend some good science fiction books or to talk oh. about your favorite science fiction authors. Oh yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, usually when I'm asked for a, a science fiction book recommendation, the first one I suggest is Aurora. So um, I don't know if I need to. <laughs> I need to um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It's just, you know, just because it's, uh, it was one that, that made me think about uh, space travel in a different way. And, um, and I really appreciated that. Um, gosh, I don't know. I, I so I've, I've really loved um, uh, Anne Leckie's uh, uh, books about the, um, you know, ancillary justice and, and the, the, that series. Um, I, I loved N.K. Jemison's Broken Earth trilogy. Um, Martha Wells, um, the uh, Murderbot uh, series. Um, those are some of the ones I've read recently that I've really, that I've really loved. Um, uh, Mary Robinette Qualls' uh, Lady Astronaut series is a lot of fun. Um, gosh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I could, I, I could keep going for a while. Um, there's, if you, if you're into, uh, if you're, if you're into sort of super hard sci-fi. Some of Greg Egan's novels are, are, are fun for that too, in, in the sense of uh, not really knowing where the science ends and the, and the science fiction begins. And, and unless you're paying a lot of attention and have some background in physics, probably not following a lot of the science as well. Um, but, uh, but I enjoy those. Um, uh, I don't know, Stan, do you wanna recommend some before I just keep going forever? <laughs> Yeah, sure. It's a it's a rich field right now. Um, and speaking of starship novels like my Aurora, thank you for that. There's a couple great starship novels, one of them by Gene Wolfe, um, who died a couple of years ago, one of the greatest science fiction writers of all time. It's called The Book of the Long Sun. And he's more famous for The Book of the New Sun, which these are four book uh, novels, but The Book of the Long Sun is a starship novel that is, I think is best. And then Molly Gloss has a a novel called The Dazzle of Day that is also a starship novel. And mm -hmm. I, I took an interest in those when I was writing Aurora and, and those are two of the best. And I, I always say Ursula Le Guin, um, she was a friend and teacher of mine and um, uh, The Left Hand of Darkness and the Dispossessed, I think probably yeah. many people already know about these books, but they're fabulous. 
Yeah, those were some of my, uh, I, 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 I devoured her work uh, growing up and, and Left Hand Darkness was a, a long favorite of mine. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So I'm just taking notes. I can put all of those in the chat. Great. Um, all right. So uh, moving to a more specific question, um, somebody was asking, Katie, could you please explain the concept of vacuum decay? How does the universe end instantly? Sure, also, sure. So yeah, um, vacuum decay. So, uh, so vacuum decay is a fun idea. Um, uh, I probably shouldn't call it fun. Where there's there's sort of an instability in in uh, in the way physics works in our universe. So, um, you know the 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 laws of physics uh, and the sort of constants of nature are all are all kind of tied up in uh, something called the Higgs field, which is the sort of energy field that, that pervades all of space and, and the way that particles and fields interact with the Higgs field sort of determines what kind of particles we have, what their properties are, and so on. And we know that the Higgs field was different in the very early universe, and there was a different sort of mix of particles and, and, and uh, interactions, and then it changed very, very early on and set up, you know, the, the way we have physics set up now, the way that particles can exist, you know, the, the existence of quarks and leptons and, you know, electrons and, and protons and all that stuff exists because the Higgs field took on this, this new value that it has right now. So this energy field has some value to it and, and that value determines how physics works in our universe. And uh, based on recent data uh, from the Large Hadron Collider, it looks like it's possible that the value that our Higgs field has, that this, this energy field throughout the universe has taken, might not be sort of the preferred value. It might, it might be capable of changing again. Um, and if it did change again, and it would do it sort of spontaneously, then suddenly our particles wouldn't hold together and the universe would like, our, just all of matter would be destroyed. <laughs> and so, and the way it would happen is that there would be this sort of quantum transition at one point in the universe that would change the value of the Higgs field at that spot. And it would create a bubble of a different kind of space, a so-called true vacuum that would expand through the universe at about the speed of light and just destroy everything in its path. Um, and because it's based on a quantum event, we can't predict exactly where or when it would happen. We can only give probabilities of, of where, of when it would happen. And so we can say it probably won't happen for 10 to the power of hundred years, if it's even possible, but we can't say for certain it won't happen right now. Um, and so it would be a very quick and painless death, you know, and just destroy the whole universe all at once. So, you know, there'd be no sort of tragic aftermath, but, um, you know, some people find it a, a very disturbing notion anyway. Um, I should say I wouldn't suggest worrying about vacuum decay. There are lots of reasons why it's not something to uh, to get upset about, and and you know, I know that people do sometimes. So just to to put that out there, don't worry about it. It's it's we're, we're probably going to be fine. Um, but it's as a physicist, it's it's a fun thing to think about. Well, it's good to have one less thing to worry about, especially now. <laughs> There's a, there's a good line near the end of Katie's book that uh, she quotes from a friend physicist. So we got way worse problems than the death of the universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's a great segue actually into this question, um, which I think I'm gonna abridge a little bit because it's very good, but long. Um, and I'm gonna pose it to both of you. What would you say is the importance of contemplating the end of all things for us here in the present? I'm thinking of the kind of ends that Stan writes about, global and social transformation, climate and environmental crisis, et cetera. One of the nefarious obstacles that climate activists face is the relegation of climate change to an unrealized future moment. And of course, the end of the universe itself is as unrealized maybe as we can get. How might we translate between these two frameworks for endings? Um, Stan, do you wanna start with that? Well, uh, let's say that um, that is a tough translation, but I would say that the way to do it is to think about death. That um, um, the connection here is an ending um, to um, consciousness, to one's own personal individual consciousness. Everybody has to face that. So everybody's gonna come to the end of their own personal universe. And that's a given. Um, and whether there's a big bang later, of course, that's off the table of, of anything that we could ever know, but probably not. And then 
what I think one of the ways that we cope with that inevitable end of the, our individual consciousness is the idea that the species will go on. And then if the species is looking like, you know, five billion years from now, I can remember my son being very upset at the idea the sun was going to uh, blow us up five billion years from now. And we were telling him that's all right. Um, it's even better than, it's not as bad as 10 to the hundredth um, billion years, but it's uh, far enough away you don't have to worry about it. But it's, um, it takes away the comfort. And this is this notion, well, humanity will spread through the universe uh, and, and humanity won't come to an end when earth comes to an end. That's already a kind of a deferment that is a little crazy. And uh, as I pointed out in Aurora, unrealistic. So um, what you can do is simply the Buddhist thing, focus on the present. What can you do right now? Enjoy the day, the carpe diem, and um, do what you can to spread the love and not worry about the, the future never actually comes. You're always stuck in the present. This is the weirdness of time. And it, it's good that we didn't talk about time very much because as St. Augustine said, the moment you talk about time, you realize there's nothing to say. None, nothing makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> mysterious. So focus on the present and, mm. and let's not worry about endings. They're gonna come later. They're gonna come to everything. In a way you could think of it as comforting, like, oh my God, I'm gonna die. But you know what? The universe is gonna die. So all things pass, mm -hmm. uh, let's just enjoy the day. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I, I, I completely agree. And I think that's one of the well, sort of, one of the sort of themes that I tried to put in my book about, you know, uh, we we get caught up in this idea of legacy, you know, and 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 investing in 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 what we think, you know, uh, how we think it'll all come out in the end. And and really, we we you know, there at some point, if the universe is going to end, we don't have a legacy. We have to find a way to have meaning in our lives right now, a meaning in the cosmos right now. And you know, that might be um, that might be in trying to make things better in whatever way you can in the moment. It might be fi finding, you know, finding a way to, to appreciate what we have without depending on, you know, it lasting forever. I mean, there are, you know, there, there, you've got to, you got to somehow come to terms with, uh, with the fact that things will inevitably decay and fall apart and so on. But, but there, you can still, you can still, do good now and and have meaning now, and I think that that's an important thing to to figure out for yourself. These, I'm going to combine these two questions because they're both along the lines of public science communication. So the first question is: Do you think that scientists are doing a better job of communicating their work now, and what do you think they could be doing better? And the second question is, should citizen science be encouraged as a matter of science policy? And what role might popular science and science fiction writing play, if at all, in driving engagement? Um, so I think that uh, I think that the big thing about science communication now that's different than in the past is that there are just way more people doing it and, and having a, um, a voice in a way that that was not possible as easily in the past. So, um, you know, I think that over time, as more people are able to uh, connect online and um, more people are, are kind of, you know, having, striking out new kinds of media to talk about science, I think that there's there's, uh, it's more possible for people to correct, connect directly with scientists. And I think that that's hugely valuable. Um, and I think it's hugely valuable because, you know, it helps, it, you know, helps people to, to hear about what's actually happening at the moment in science. And sometimes a sci an active scientist has a perspective on, on their work that, that a science, you know, somebody, a science journalist or something doesn't have quite as direct a, a, an access to. But I think it's more about trust and, and um, that personal connection. So if, if you know somebody who is working on, uh, you know, uh, like pharmaceutical development or climate change or something like that, you're, you're less likely to just say, oh, those people are all just out for money and, and they're corrupt or, or whatever. Like you know, there's, there's that, that understanding of what science is, who's doing it, why we're doing it at all, I think is hugely valuable for a society. And, um, and I think that the fact that more, more scientists are able to 
communicate directly to people and interact with people who are who are not in science. Uh, I think that that's a, a big um, a big plus. I mean, it comes with minuses because then you have you also have a lot of other people who are uh, you know maybe not doing a great job with talking about science or even trying to undermine in various ways. Like there's a lot of other things going on, but I think in general that's that's a big positive that connection. I've seen big improvements in this, um, the period of climate change, because I think we can historicize this uh, a little bit. I mean, Galileo, for instance, a great science uh, um, popularizer across Europe and made a big impact by his uh, writing ability and clear writing for the public is a, a, an important scientific tool. It's one of the things that made Carl Sagan so important. All of the famous scientists in our culture turn out to be really good writers and that's part of their fame. But what I saw was that after World War II, the scientific community said, look, just give us the money, we'll give you the, the goods and we'll make the decisions about science and don't bother us, just fund us and you'll enjoy the results of it. And then when they said to the world around the turn of the last century, um, we are accidentally torching the planet and there wasn't a quick response to that scientists realized that the, the post-war model of just give us the money and we'll give you the goods is not adequate to this situation. And they be, the, even the word Anthropocene is an intervention by scientists trying to underline the gravity of our situation. So the fact that we're in the Anthropocene is scientists telling us the situation is dangerous. What humans are doing now can change the biosphere for, for um, uh, centuries. And so, uh, and then you do see the uh, social media, you see um, uh, young scientists like Katie that can actually describe what they're doing articulately and to a, a wide audience of peers. And it makes a difference. I th we'll be better off. Uh, my whole theory has been the more scientific this culture becomes, the better we're gonna get through this century. So it's looking better all the time in terms of that communication. I think we have time for one or two more questions. So, sorry, we've got a lot, which is fantastic. Um, all right, this is to both of you. For Stan, how do you think the universe will end? And for Katie, how do you define utopia? <laughs> okay, uh, do you wanna go first, Stan? Yeah, isn't this backwards on purpose? Yes, how do I think the world will end? Um, I'm, I mean, I just finished Katie's book. And so I'm saying um, uh, just a slow uh, cooling off heat death, dissipation off into nothingness with possibly this, um, what did you call it, phantom? Phantom dark energy? A phantom dark energy making it even more so, I mean, even deathier than, than the <laughs> ordinary heat death. Uh, that, I mean, w w but why should what I uh, say matter? I mean, I, this is just so impressionistic, but as a novelist, I'm saying that's what it looks like to me. And so maybe I'm not very famous for the ends of my novels for a reason, I don't know. <laughs> um. Okay, so what what defines utopia? That was my question. Um, gosh, I don't know. Um, I I don't know because because I I've read enough science fiction to to be deeply suspicious of every utopian idea that's ever come along, and um, and I think it's very hard to uh, to imagine uh, something that that would be utopia to everybody in it. Um, but uh, but I think that I don't know. I, I think that um, uh, just a much more sort of equal distribution of everything is is uh, is something that that would would help a lot. And um, I don't know. I mean, just just some something with something where there's there's some kind of understanding of, of harmony with the environment and with others and, and not a, a kind of constant battle. That sounds like a utopia to me. And I feel like right now we're in a, we're in a situation where everybody's fighting everybody all the time. And, and we're all kind of, I mean, especially right now, you know, we've, we've all spent the last 10 months kind of swimming in our own cortisol uh, 
you know, stuck up in our houses and, 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 you know, having fights on the street about various things. And, and I think that that's like a utopia is something where people can, can feel okay to relax. Um, and I, I think that that's, uh, that's rare uh, today. So. I, I agree. <laughs> um, so to, to end on a more tangible and hopefully hopeful note, I'm going to ask this question. Um, what actions could the Biden administration take to tackle climate change in the next four years? How should we think about political feasibility when it comes to climate change legislation and action, especially in the United States? Um, well, the Green New Deal, HR 109, is a great uh, launching pad for um, good climate action because that is um, truly a new deal in the sense of having social justice and environmental justice written into it from the start. And it sort of uh, corrects the injustices of the New Deal of the 30s. And it has a green component that includes putting a proper price on carbon and um, the government pushing for rapid transition to um, clean energies. So the, there are no mysteries in that, um, uh, in terms of what to do. It's really a matter of just uh, pushing the process and making it happen. Um, and, and so I would, I would refer people to the Paris Agreement and to um, the Green New Deal and the European Union's uh, uh, green recovery deal coming off of the pandemic by supporting full employment by way of decarbonization. These are um, no brainers, as is a progressive taxation and carbon taxes. They're all legal. They're all just changes of laws that we change all the time. There shouldn't be anything controversial about them since they would be saving so much. Um, dodging the mass extinction event, that's my simple definition of utopia at this point. If we dodge a mass extinction event, we have created a utopia for the people to follow us. Yeah. yeah. Well, on that note, um, I just want to thank you both for this fantastic conversation. Do you have any closing thoughts? Um. Um, well, I would like to say as a closing thought that it's, uh, this has all been a very heady conversation. And one of the things that you can do in terms of living in the present is remembering even the pandemic that um, um, you live in a bodily reality. Um, I want you to know that Katie is a basketball player and a, a power forward, a power forward with an outside <laughs> shot. <laughs> and I don't know, a ball in the pandemic might be dangerous, but you can always get outdoors, go for a walk, yeah. do something outdoors. It's um, even in the depths of your uh, tremendous New England winter, colder than Antarctica, um, you know, some time outdoors will be so good for you and good for the planet too. Yeah, I, I've, I've taken up running in this, in this uh, pandemic for a while. I was running three miles every day just to like be out of my, out of my home office. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not doing it quite that often now, but still, uh, you know, just, yeah, getting outside is so helpful and moving and being active is, is super helpful. So I, I, I definitely agree with that, that advice. Well, thank you both for spending your evening with us and talking about the, the ends of the world and hopefully the aversion of those <laughs> ends. Um, please everybody learn more about these fantastic books and purchase the end of everything in the ministry for the future on harvard.com. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good night. Keep reading, stay warm, and happy holidays. Thank Thanks you. So much. Thank you. Thanks, so much. Thanks Katie. Bye. Thanks, Lauren. Bye, Katie. Thanks, Thanks, Bye. It's always Bye. so fun. But we'll talk again. <laughs>